So another first moment that you were a critical part of was the enterprise. Right. Um, tell me about, first of all, I guess for, for people who have a little different, maybe this generation that I'm in and the generation that follows me seems to have a different interpretation of our control over our career path. Okay. And you know, and how we think we're building our career. So right. you were you were doing that. You were an Apollo astronaut and you were going to command Apollo nineteen. Right. And I then hope. Yeah. you hoped, right. And then so how did you respond when you found out none of that was going to be right. where you were headed? Yeah, I, I the way that was set up was I had gone after Apollo thirteen, uh, I think within a month, uh, Dee gave me my next job and it told me I was the commander backup commander on Apollo 16, which put me in the three mission alignment, which add three to 16 and you get 19, which were real missions at that point in time. So I was assigned uh, and I was happy with it, Jerry Carr to be a lunar module pilot and uh, Bill Pogue command module pilot, which been great. That had been two Marines on the moon at the same time. Boy, that's been terrific. Uh, but at any rate, uh, fate would have it after about, we were about training about four months and they canceled 18 and 19. So that went away. It was kind of second point of disappointment. And I finished up the uh, train assignment uh, with Ed Mitchell and Stu Russo, who had come off 14, Deke assigned them to uh, support me and fulfill in the backup assignment behind John, John Young, uh, Charlie Duke, and Ken Manningly. And when that uh, was completed, I, again, I was thinking ahead, even at that time, of next uh, career when I couldn't fly anymore, for whatever reason. And I went to, uh, to Al and Deke and talked to them about that thought. And they arranged for me to go to the Harvard Business School to, uh, PM, through the PMD program, Program for Management Development. And uh, so I went up to, it was a four-month pressure cooker kind of course frankly, mostly geared to uh, civil company uh, type uh, agenda, things they covered in marketing and sales and whatever. But at any rate, it was a good uh, train, but also in finance and uh, budgets and things. So uh, I asked for and got an assignment then uh, to go to the Arbiter Project Office. So I left the astronaut office. I actually, when I, I, before I, just before that assignment, I actually uh, worked on the shuttle proposal evaluations for a fellow named Bass Red. We uh, did the integrated vehicle of performance analysis of the four proposals that had been submitted by Rockwell, uh, Grumman, uh, Lockheed, and MacDac. Uh, so we went through uh, to support the uh, source selection board that ended up picking Rockwell and uh, to build a shuttle. So then I went straight to work for Aaron Cohen who was head of the Arbiter Project Office for four years. So I was out of the astronaut office in that role, more in program management with the design development of space shuttle, Arbiter in particular. So I had that experience of the, and, and Aaron let me do some of the budget work, uh, each budget cycle and that kind of thing to get a little more experience. And uh, the program, and I was on on the change boards. I was on part of the change board that looked at every engineering change that was done along the way. I virtually coordinated and uh, ran an ops team on all the design reviews through uh, critical design review on uh, Enterprise and through preliminary design review on Columbia. And that's when they made the crew selections. So I was named uh, with Garden Fullerton to be crew one for Enterprise and Dick Truly and. Joe Engel, crew two. Turns out Dick is from Mississippi, as I am. So I always like to point out that Enterprise never flew, but that there was a Mississippian aboard. Every flight, all of the flights. But at any rate, uh, so now, now it was uh, the front end of getting ready to fly. We had no simulators working, uh, so it was like starting from scratch. Uh, it was kind of nice because we were set off as a separate operation from the main program that was continuing on the path of getting Columbia ready to go to orbit. So I, I had Deke Slayton as the uh, uh, test director. Uh, to get the fellow's name uh, with him, his deputy was steeped in Edwards' uh, flight test, uh, McMurray. He was Deke's uh, deputy. I conned a lot of Kennedy people to go. I went down Charlie Mars uh, 
arranged me to meet in the, in the mission briefing room. That's where they have the FRRs, flight interviews for all the launches. I said, gather up, Charlie, all the people you think might want to go participate in the ALT. I said, it'd be good for Kennedy people to get some hands on on the vehicle before it shows up an orbiter, before one shows up at Kennedy. So I about actually ended up with 85 people from Kennedy, ne never done before. They normally showed up at the plants for big tests on the spacecraft, but they'd only pop in and look at that test, observe it, and then go back to Kennedy. So they didn't have the hands-on participation. So some of them became the lead test directors uh, at the, in, in the test we did on Enterprise, like Bob Seek, heard that name. Mm -hmm. uh, another fellow also became uh, one of the early flight directors uh, for launch at Kennedy. So... Uh, it was kind of funny. It was arranged in the mission briefing room, and I prepared a slideshow. These people from Kennedy, I know it'd be kind of foreign to them going to Edwards in the desert. So the slideshow I prepared never showed any desert scenes except at dawn or dusk when it's kind of pretty. And I showed snow in the high Sierras, not the high Sierras, but also to Hatchby Mountains and San Jacinto Mountains back of LA, and I showed them uh, uh, <laughs> Santa Monica Beach and you know, I showed them great scenes. Uh, they told them that was all within an hour of the, the station they'd be at at Edwards. So anyway, I conned these people and their families, uh, which they, they took over one apartment complex. They called it the uh, KSC Ghetto uh, at uh, Palmdale, California. But anyway, they came and got a lot of good experience ahead of time about what, how, to, how an orbiter works because they were hands-on into it. And uh, so we had our test team. I pulled the best, uh, call the best leftover Rockwell uh, test conductor type people. So we really had a top grade A team overall. Uh, we were small in ourselves. We had the, t the four of us, the prime crews are going to fly it, but we had Bob Coe, uh, Bob, Bob Coe and uh, Obermeyer, uh, Bob Obermeyer as a sword. Uh, we had uh, Dave Ballard, my old uh, system engineer and others, and we had a small mission control ran by Don Putty, and they occupied actually the recovery room that was kind of offset to the main control room in mission control. That, that was their control room for enterprise. But it had a suite of the right experts in that control room to handle the systems and enterprise, which didn't have all of them that were going to be in the orbital bird. So it was a tight forming team, but at the same time, we knew a waterfront we had to cover early on was very broad and geographically displaced. Like our simulators were uh, at uh, Johnson, obviously, the prime moving base simulator, and uh, the flight simulator, the STA, we normally would fly it at White Sands or at Edwards. Uh, the, test, the test work was done, uh, some of it at Johnson, and the sale, and then we had the ADL at Downey, California, and of course the build-up and manufacturing of Orbiter and its filling out, finished manufacturing and testing now the systems in it were at Palmdale, California. So there's a lot of waterfront to cover among the few of us that were trying to cover this. I'm talking about uh, among the crew, and so we we split up and uh, sort of took lead assignments uh, like. Uh, uh, Dick Truly and Bob Crippen, I think Ken Manningly and Bob, and Bob Co, and, uh, Hank Hartsfield. Spent a lot of time with the software. That was a prime. They were going to worry about IBM software getting built right. And uh, I took on the vehicle testing at Palmdale, but I'd pull people in as needed for special tests uh, because that was my forte back from all the work on the Grumman Miller module. Uh, Joe took over the simulator development, including the SDA, and flew some of the development flights with Grumman, developing the airplane even. So we spent some time just getting things refined again, the way we could really start testing what we're going to do and figuring out now here's, here's what mission profiles are going to be, et cetera, which weren't very complicated, obviously, launching off a carrier right aside the big lake bed. But... <laughs> But at any rate, uh, it was kind of a very fun program. Uh, it was very efficient. Bob Seek tells me that was the most fun time he's ever had in his career. And he said it was fun because you, that there was no bureaucracy of any sort. You had so much authority, ability to do what you needed to do. Uh, so he, he felt that's the way he described how he felt working that aspect as a, uh, a you know, the, see, he got involved even at launch day. He or the other Kennedy guys, about four of them that were the lead guys, 
they would actually get the vehicle ready, if you want to call it, to launch. In other words, to get it ready to be taxied out on the 747. So they were there just like Mission Control would be at uh, Houston. Then the turnover to Putty and his group when we we're going to get Evorn. So it was kind of worked in that same way for these flights. Uh, so anyway, it was exciting times in that respect. Now, the, the day of launch was uh, uh, very high. For me, it was very, I felt a lot of pressure, more so than I felt on Apollo 13 on that launch or uh, – from a different aspect than most people would think. It was not the uh, safety, at least for myself or Gardo, uh, we were sitting in ejection seats. So we had a good plan B. Uh, but we were at a point in the program uh, where we had changed presidents. Uh, we'd gone from Nixon, who was in this, and the shuttle program was Nixon's program, quote, whatever. And Carter, Jimmy Carter, President Carter had come in Within a couple of months of his inauguration, he canceled the B-1 bomber. That scares a little bit. It's not connected with shuttle, but it's aerospace. And there had never been anything in the election, in the uh, uh, debates or discussions about space to speak of. And that whole, so we didn't, we didn't really know where these past or future president felt in that regard. And uh, NASA at the same time, in that same time frame, I can't remember the relative to the time we blew that day, but had had to announce uh, almost a two year slip in the orbital schedule because of the tile problem. And so uh, with that facing us, I was wondering, uh, my fear was had we crashed or damaged Enterprise because we had no backup, no backup vehicle, which is not normally you don't want in a test program, but we had canceled it for cost. We had a backup vehicle back way back when, but for cost saving early on, we cut it out of the program that I could, this flight, if it failed, could be the cause of the cancellation of the shuttle program right there. So I had that sort of on my mind, uh, approaching that, that day. And that time we climbed aboard, it was reflected by other people's thoughts, and the fact on each side of the ladder, we climbed up from the lower hatch to get into the ejection seats. There was a Polaroid picture of a figure in a blue flight suit like we were wearing. And they had a helmet on their heads and uh, the oxygen mask dangling loose, but the visor down. So you couldn't tell who these people were, but it's meant to be me and Gardo. And we're sitting on these huge sweepers in a hangar, the kind of sweepers you think of as the cleaning a bit huge metropolitan city street. And the sign there said, if you follow this up, well, actually it was a different word. I won't say here. If you follow this up, this is your next job. So, so the workers are also worried about how this thing would go. Uh, so anyway, that was, uh, that was launch day for free flight one. Of course, uh, as we all know, it went uh, beautifully. The flight control, uh, which we designed uh, with uh, gained highly to be a good handling qualities, uh, flew be it flew better than anything we had seen in the shuttle train aircraft or any of our simulations, engineering simulations. So it flew very well. So they did, they did a good job on uh, the flight control system design. And... Uh, we, we had a backup, actually, a simplified backup system we could have reverted to to call it get it on the ground system, uh, which we did not have to use. Kind of, kind of plan C was the ejection seats. Uh, <laughs> plan B was to switch to the backup system, control system. But at any rate, it worked beautifully. We didn't hit the 747. And if, if weren't about safety, that was the only safety concern I had was for the 747 crew. If for whatever reason we had gone out of control right after separation, because that's the first time we're going to know how this flight control system worked. Uh, if we had hit the 747 and damaged it sufficiently, uh, I don't. They would have not got out, so we would have we would have lost the 747 crew. So they they were the ones that took the if you want to call it heavy personal risk, not Gardo and I. Uh, 
So anyway, that's uh, the way the program went. It was a very successful program overall. We finished it two months. We flew that first free flight within two weeks of a schedule that had arbitrarily been set two years before. So we were only two weeks late calendar-wise on that first release flight. And the program finished two months ahead of time. Eight, eight test pro flights were flew. So for a test flight program, it was very a highly successful program uh, compared to a lot of early airplanes have you know, problems in their uh, early testing phase. Do you think that maybe the success of, of that aspect of it, of the efficiency, do you attribute that to the lack of bureaucracy and the empowerment that people felt? No, I wouldn't say lack of bureaucracy. You know, you know, that, that maybe speeded some things up, but no, it's clearly we had the right people assigned. Uh, we had the right uh, mix of, uh, of NASA people, uh, the best contractor people. So uh, we had kind of an A-team uh, overall. And that's what I think uh, allowed all of that to go the way it went. That's probably true in every business. Oh, yeah. Yes, no question. Yeah, the bureaucracy uh, won't stop good people from getting it done. It may slow them up a little bit, but uh, they, will, they will get the job done if you got the right people.